uh, and more people, more people will join us. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to our uh, to the CMS seminar series. Uh, today we're honored to have Dr. George Sibidis from uh, Fourth, from the Institute of Electronic Structure and Laser at Fourth, to be more specific. Uh, a few words about our speaker. Uh, Dr. George Sibidis is a research scientist at the Institute of Electronic Structure and Laser at Fourth. He received his bachelor's degree from the Physics Department of the University of Athens. His Master of Science from the Physics Department at the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD in theoretical high energy physics at the University of Sussex in 1997. After spending some years in the Mathematics Institute at the University of Warwick, he joined the Institute of Electronic Structure and Laser at Fourth as a research scientist. In 2017, he visited the University of Lyon, Laboratoire Hubert Curien, in the University of Saint Monnet, Saint Etienne, France, as a visiting professor. His interests include theoretical approaches related to ultrafast laser interaction with materials and laser processing. He has been the author of numerous peer-reviewed scientific papers on laser matter interaction, and he has been invited to a large number of international conferences on laser matter interaction, as well as participated in many competitive research projects. Um, Dr. Tsubidis, the stage is yours, and thank you again for accepting the talk. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank Bagelis for the invitation and the opportunity I was given to uh, give this talk and also to present some of our research activities uh, in front of your audience. And I understand that uh, most of the people in this audience uh, are not very familiar with concepts uh, such as ultra short laser pulses. So I believe that I have to make a small introduction to, uh, to make a quite uh, of you with you know this concept. So I understand that most of you know that okay we have the white light and uh, our eyes uh, is uh, I mean are capable to see the mixture of wavelengths that constitute white light. Each color of light has a different wavelength. For example, uh, blue has uh, a, a smaller wavelength than uh, red. Uh, by contrast, uh, laser is a different thing. And uh, lasers do not occur in, na in nature as we know. So we need some special devices to produce this, to, to emit this electromagnetic uh, radiation. And uh, all, uh, I mean, uh, laser beams uh, uh, have uh, emit light waves that have more or less similar wavelengths. In other words, uh, the dispersion of the, the, in the range of the wavelengths that, uh, are, that are produced is uh, very small. And this is uh, why laser beams are very narrow, very bright, and can be focused into a very tiny spot. Uh, on the other hand, you know that the laser beams can travel very long distances. We see that uh, uh, you know, in uh, laser shows, and uh, they can also concentrate a lot of, of their energy on a very small area. And this is actually the reason why lasers can be used for, in very, for um, uh, various purposes, but also for changing the morphology of uh, the irradiated solid. And this is actually the, uh, the, the objective of this talk. Oops. Why cannot? Uh, so some uh, characteristics uh, of lasers I want to, to describe here. Uh, most uh, laser beams have a Gaussian B profile, um, although we can uh, produce even more complex uh, profiles, but uh, here in this uh, uh, presentation, I will uh, restrict my attention uh, just new to the Gaussian beam profiles. Uh, so we know that uh, from undergraduate physics, that electromagnetic radiation has two components, uh, one electric and one magnetic uh, field. The, electro the electric field, uh, for example, has uh, a polarization, so which is, in is indicated by this uh, vector, which shows the direction uh, to which the electric field oscillates. So this is the intensity profile. And if, so, if somebody looks at the electric field uh, along the uh, R and Z direction, this is what it looks like. And this is the intensity profile. Uh, but uh, uh, if we want also to include another dimension, the temporal dimension, 
we have to uh, multiply this part, this intensity with uh, uh, this function. And uh, then uh, this means that uh, we produce uh, some, uh, uh, we can modulate uh, uh, the, 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 the duration of uh, the pulse and to some certain uh, uh, degree. And uh, we can produce uh, pulses uh, uh, that last for a nanosecond, picosecond, or femtosecond. Here you can see. I just want to recall what uh, femto, pico, and nano means. The question rising now is: uh, What is the advantage of of using this kind of uh, uh, pulse durations? Uh, the answer is very easy to uh, to uh, to be reached. For example, if you see th this is uh, the result of some experiments, you see that. As we move from the nanosecond pulse laser regime to picosecond and femtosecond, we see that for femtosecond pulses, we were able to produce some very nice, some very precise cutting. And uh, this is actually the advantage we can be used, you know, I mean, um, for many uh, laser applications and laser technology, I mean, industrial applications. And this is uh, the current uh, uh, state of uh, uh, the use of such pulses at the moment, but also there is a prospect of uh, an enhanced uh, uh, use of this uh, type of uh, laser sources in the future. And this um, also is facilitated by the uh, gradual uh, drop uh, in the price of uh, femtosecond pulses. So there are many applications that can benefit from the use of femtosecond pulses. So you can see some of these uh, metrology, material science, uh, uh, particle acceleration, production of secondary uh, radiation sources, uh, uh, and also for some uh, uh, biomedical reasons. And this is actually the reason why in 2018, uh, the Nobel Prize was, was, was awarded to Gerard Moreau um, and also Donna Strickland for their method for genera of generating high intensity ultra short optical pulses because of the impact uh, of laser technology on very, I mean, on many in, uh, applications. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, uh, material processing and uh, uh, as I saw, there are so many applications uh, that, that they can benefit from the use of uh, uh, laser sources. So sometimes we want to reach uh, uh, the sky, but uh, it is well known that uh, sometimes the inspiration comes mostly from the ground. We know that uh, there are many species in nature, uh, flowers, uh, uh, reptiles, uh, mammals, uh, uh, insects, and others uh, uh, that exhibit some very uh, significant properties, wetting properties, directional fluid transport, low underwater friction, anti-reflection properties, or water repellence. Uh, water repellence. Uh, and when I say when when I say water repellence, I mean super hydrophobicity or uh, super hydrophilicity. What all these species have in common, in common is that their uh, uh, surface, their skin is uh, patterned, textured with uh, uh, very small micro or nano uh, scale, uh, periodic or aperiodic structures. So the question rising is whether we can transfer this kind of technology to artificial materials and produce this kind of complexity uh, on the patterns, produce patterns that can, of course, provide uh, uh, these materials with uh, some uh, uh, similar properties. So in our lab, and of course, you know, over the past decades in other labs, uh, such uh, structures have been produced. So you see uh, the, the level of complexity that uh, has been produced in various types of materials by modulating, by controlling uh, a number of laser parameters. So uh, this uh, biomimetic uh, uh, surfaces, as we call them, since we just want to emulate uh, nature, 
can be classified uh, according to the orientation and also uh, on the uh, size of uh, uh, the periodicity. I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the size of uh, these structures. So we can classify this laser in use periodic surface structures uh, to um, LSFL structures as they are called. So low spatial frequency leaps or high spatial frequency leaps. So the periodicity for the first one, I mean, if lambda is the wavelength of the laser beam, so it, uh, the periodicity is of the size of uh, uh, the laser wavelength, while for HSFL structure is uh, much smaller. Uh, looking at the HSFL structures, the, the orientation is uh, depending on the material, parallel or uh, in, other, in other materials, uh, perpendicular to the laser polarization. The LSFL structures uh, um, is, uh, are mostly in metals perpendicular to the laser polarization, but also there are some other structures, the grooves, which are uh, much bigger. So these are supra wavelength structures. And also we have the production of spikes, which are some, type, some types of protrusions that are produced, that are fabricated on top of the material. Um, one uh, uh, interesting thing is that uh, uh, that although we started with a Gaussian beam, we ended up in the fabrication, in the production of periodic structures. So uh, the reason is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so this, uh, somebody might say there are some type of self-organization of matter, and this is what we want to discuss in, uh, in the next slides. And uh, of course, this type, uh, of uh, periodic structures have uh, many applications in photonics, uh, biology, medicine, uh, for wetting properties, microfluidics, or other uh, properties. So more or less, we manage to produce biomimetic uh, uh, surfaces uh, that have uh, the functionalities that exhibit the functionalities, the natural materials, the natural species exhibit. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, uh, these three, the fabrication on, uh, of, of these three types of uh, structures, LSFL, grooves, and spikes. But in order to be able to control uh, you know, the, the surface pattern features and to build a link be between the applications and the capability to modify the properties uh, of a solid, of a target, we have to uh, introduce, we have to understand uh, how laser interacts uh, with matter. So we have to understand the fundamentals. There are some critical parameters that uh, play significant role uh, in uh, the, uh, the surface morphologies, the topographies that are produced, the fluence, that are the energy per per area, the number of pulses, so the energy dose, the laser wavelength, the laser polarization, the angle of incidence, the crystal orientation, the pulse duration, of course, the material, whether it is metal, semiconductor, or uh, dielectric material, the thickness of the material. The, uh, if we use more than one pulse to produce more uh, fancy, I mean, more complex uh, uh, beams, the temporal separation between pulses, the shape of the beam. I told you previously that in principle we use a Gaussian beam, but we can use, of course, we can employ some more complex uh, uh, beams. So we can shape the beam. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, the, the impact of, of these two uh, parameters, the fluence and numbers, the number of pulses. So the outline of my talk, uh, is uh, the following. Firstly, I will pre provide, I will present first a multi-scale physical uh, uh, process description uh, that uh, describes uh, uh, how a laser interacts with matter. So I will restrict my attention to, to how semiconductors respond to, to this type of irradiation. 
Um, it, since we uh, were interested in uh, discussing surface modification, uh, I will uh, discuss uh, uh, some very important effects such as hydrodynamic, hydrodynamical effects and elastic effects, which play a very important role in the formation of the structures. Uh, also, I will present briefly um, surface patterning through some specially varying intensity profiles. So briefly, I will introduce uh, a, a new technique, which is based on the interference of uh, uh, two uh, beams. Uh, then I will continue with some challenges, and then I will conclude uh, uh, with some remarks my talk. So let's see first how uh, the material uh, responds when uh, we radiate uh, the solid with femtosecond pulses. So this is the uh, femtosecond pulse. This is the pulse duration. And uh, we radiate material with, we radiate the material with a laser pulse. And uh, um, during the, the pulse, uh, we have uh, excitation. I mean, the, the electrons absorb most of the energy because they have uh, a much smaller heat capacity than the lattice system and uh, they get excited. Uh, so in the beginning, um, the electrons uh, reach an out of equilibrium state and through electron electron scattering and also some electron phonon scattering, the system starts to thermalize the electron system. So this uh, process takes place within the pulse or even a bit later. So in the second regime, after the pulse ends, we have uh, uh, the electron phonon uh, uh, coupling. Uh, so the electron system interacts with the lattice system through scattering and uh, uh, gradually the, the two baths uh, because we can uh, envisage the systems as two baths, the electron system, the lattice system, they exchange heat, they exchange energy. So we have uh, a relax relaxation state when the uh, energy of the electrons uh, is transferred to the lattice system. Uh, since we uh, are interested in uh, investigating the response of the semiconducting system, uh, we know that for semiconductors, there is a, a band gap. So when we, we want to excite the material, we want to excite electrons, we have the valence band and the conduction band. So it is important, uh, the laser beam, the, the, the photon energy we use to be significant so that we can, the, the electrons can reach the conduction bands. Um, so with respect to this one, we have to be a bit careful because there are some processes that can facilitate uh, this excitation. So uh, with respect to the carrier excitation, um, I have uh, sketched here what happens. This, here's the valence band and here's the conduction band. Here's the pulse. And uh, these uh, arrows here show the transition of the electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. So you see that uh, uh, if, the valen if uh, the photon energy is enough, is sufficient to excite uh, an, el an electron through a single photon absorption, then we can have this excitation, but then we can have um, a secondary uh, process that the electron requires a two photon absorption in order to reach this level. So you understand that this uh, occurs with a smaller probability uh, than this one. But of course, if this cannot occur because of uh, uh, the photon energy, if it is small, uh, then the second one uh, should occur. Then we can have a free carrier absorption. So we uh, assume, for example, that we can have this situation here that we have, oops, that we have the, a free carrier absorption. So we have carriers which are already in the conduction band and when they uh, absorb energy, they just move 
inside the conduction band, so to different energy levels, higher energy levels, but we don't increase through this uh, process the carrier density. And of course, we can have a third regime, the impact ionization, when we have this scheme, uh, if uh, the energy of uh, the electron in the conduction band is uh, big enough to collide with, uh, so that uh, when the electron collides with uh, uh, an electron in the valence band, then it excites that into the conduction band while the, the former one stays in the conduction band uh, uh, as well. Then we have the thermalization regime. Uh, when we have uh, the electron, 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 and electron phonon scattering, as I said. And then we can have uh, a, a third regime when we can have uh, the so called chiral combination. So um, the electron in the conduction band can uh, lose energy, and then uh, through a radiant uh, process, it can fall to the valence band, or the electrons can uh, lose energy through diffusion inside uh, bigger depths, or uh, another process which is called Oser recombination, um, which uh, involves three particles. So the electron falls into the valence band, and then an another electron. Uh, due to this excess of energy moves into the into a higher state. And uh, thermal effects, uh, uh, we have the thermal diffusion. Uh, this uh, uh, happens when uh, the electron system has already uh, transferred the, its energy to the lattice system. Then the lattice uh, system uh, has been hit, I mean, is heated, and then we have thermal diffusion, uh, heat diffusion inside and then in a bigger depths. And uh, if uh, uh, the energy of uh, the lattice system is very big, then we have mass removal. And, uh, um, and this is what I'm going to discuss next. So all these processes uh, can be summarized in this theoretical model. Um, so these uh, two ray equations describe the two temperature model, uh, describe the change of heat between the electron system and the lattice system. We see here the coupling, the exchange of heat between the two system. This is the source term, which applies uh, in principle only to, to the electron system because the lattice system uh, is cold at the time. And of course, uh, since we have a semiconductor, we have uh, um, the exchange, I mean, the, the carrier density uh, change. And uh, just to compare what happens uh, in the femtosecond, I mean, if we use femtosecond or longer pulses, you see here the difference. This black line here shows the, the length of the, of the pulse. So I use the femtosecond. Pulse. So you see that this is the electron temperature, while this is the lattice temperature. So this means that it requires some time for the electron system to relax and uh, change all of its energy to the lattice system. So this happens after the end of the pulse. So this is the reason actually why we get uh, this precise um, uh, cutting. Um, with respect you know, to, to the use of longer pulses, because if we, if we had the longer pulse, then the thermal effects will be more uh, intense. So this uh, more intense uh, thermal effects lead to this uh, debris, which is, which of course uh, are some undesired effects. So this is uh, why actually, uh, when um, um, uh, Gerard Moreau uh, came here and gave a talk uh, a, couple of, uh, we, a couple of years ago, uh, after the award of uh, the Nobel Prize, he said he was talking about uh, uh, 
the reckless experiment of one of his students and uh, the femtosecond pulse hit his eye. He was taken to the hospital and then the ophthalmologist said that, uh, that the damage was perfect because of this, because he used femtosecond pulses. So um, in this multiscale phys physical model I described just to you, um, we have included all these processes. However, there is a missing link. We were interested in discussing, describing surface modification. So we have to include phase transition and mass removal processes. So somehow we have to incorporate into our model uh, the way this uh, uh, occur. So since we, I mean, if we, uh, we want to talk about uh, uh, surface modification through hydrodynamical movement, we have to uh, incorporate um, some uh, module which is related to fluid dynamics. So these are uh, Navier-Stokes equations uh, that uh, we have to, to use. So all these terms, all the parameters are described here. And uh, um, since we have since uh, we have a, a Gaussian profile and the Gaussian profile uh, of, of the beam uh, gives a variant, variance in temperature profile special uh, variance, then uh, the surface tension uh, vary as well. So it's going to lead to a development of a clockwise flow which eventually causes what a surface depression in the region uh, of high pressure. So we get this profile here. And uh, if we irradiate the material with just one pulse, we get these humps at the end. But uh, so far I have not talked about periodic surface structures. What happens uh, uh, if we irradiate the material with more pulses? If we radiate the material with more pulses, and in principle, even with one pulse, because uh, a material, a solid, in principle, the surface of my material is, uh, is not flat. It comprises some defects. So these defects lead to the formation of uh, some uh, corrugated uh, topography like this. So if we radiate the material to this topography with a second pulse, some uh, uh, far field, uh, near field effects occur. And uh, if we, uh, here I have some sketches. If we uh, perform some electromagnetic uh, simulations to see what is the response of the material, the electromagnetic fingerprint of the material, we see here, I, I cannot, you see some periodic modulation of the electric field. Well, it, I don't know, I, yes, uh, I, I can show that better here. Uh, here in this simulation, what I have done, what we have done is that we try to emulate this corrugated profile with an, an uh, alteration of uh, holes and bumps. So you see that if we radiate a material with uh, a Gaussian beam, we have an interference of the far fields that, are, that will be produced. So in the end, the electromagnetic fingerprint will be this uh, periodic, uh, not structures, periodic waves uh, with uh, of periodicity equal or quite close to the wavelength of the laser beam. So what happens is that this, um, uh, modulations, this periodic modulation then is going to be transferred into the electron uh, temperature and through electron phonon coupling to the lattice temperature and through, I mean, when then uh, the material melts because we assume that conditions are such are sufficient to melt the material, then all the hydrodynamical parameters will have uh, a periodic profile. So you see, what is the uh, fingerprint on the fluid, uh, uh, which of course remains upon solidification. So in the end, we get this surface profile, this pattern, which uh, exactly is the pattern of the LSFL structures. 
And you, you see here the experiments, the result of the experiment and the similarity of uh, the simulated experiment with the uh, real experiments. Um, I, I just wanted to, to, to point out here, I don't want to, to, to go into much detail, that as we uh, increase the number of pulses, then this periodicity um, appears to, 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 to become smaller. And uh, this is due to some uh, uh, electromagnetic effects uh, uh, that shift the, uh, the, the periodicity of uh, these electromagnetic waves into uh, smaller uh, wavelengths. So we have a blue shift. Uh, so the question was uh, with, uh, that I mean the question rising now is what happens if we continue to irradiate the material either with uh, uh, at higher fluencies or with uh, a bigger number of pulses because we understand that as we repeatedly irradiate the material then the height of this um, the height of this uh, uh, lips, uh, ripples uh, becomes bigger. So the corrugation becomes uh, bigger and the height becomes bigger. So um, uh, in order to, to explain, in order to uh, explain uh, the, the formation of a different type of structures in that case, which are, uh, which are formed, which are oriented parallel to the laser polarization in our supra wavelength, we have, I mean, we will borrow a paradigm from uh, the lava movement or the cloud movement or the mega ripples on uh, the surface of, uh, on Mars. So uh, if uh, somebody looks uh, at some uh, uh, textbooks from, I mean, on fluid dynamics, if we have, uh, a uh, very big uh, uh, gradients of uh, temperature because this is um, uh, the, 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 this is the point. This is what is going to be caused if we have big height of uh, ripples. Then we have uh, the production of uh, counter uh, rotating convection rolls uh, that are produced, and uh, of course depends. I mean, uh, we cannot say that if uh, we solve the problem if we apply the Navier-Stokes equations um, that will end up with uh, the formation of periodic structures um, because we, we need these periodic structures to be stable. Um, so it, it happens, I mean, so the, the solution, a special solution of the Navier-Stokes equation that uh, explains the formation of uh, these structures says, is that the, uh, at some certain wavelength of these uh, convection rolls, um, these periodic structures are uh, stable. So, so what we did was uh, to, to, to choose these periodicities and uh, we managed to uh, simulate and, um, I mean, uh, uh, successfully uh, the production, I mean, the formation of these uh, uh, periodic structures that are oriented parallel to the laser polarization and are perpendicular to the uh, initially formed ripples. And uh, of course, this is not the case only for uh, photon energies uh, uh, related to 800 nanometers that uh, we used in the previous uh, uh, transparencies, but also if we use uh, uh, higher photon energies or uh, smaller photon energies, again, we are able to produce both type of structures on top of uh, silicon. And uh, of course, so we, can, uh, uh, increase, we can increase even uh, further the fluence and uh, we can increase even uh, the number of pulses, the energy dose. And in that case, we end up with uh, uh, some uh, uh, protrusions, so some more complex structures like this. But uh, I, 
uh, I don't want to discuss more uh, this uh, because it is still, I mean, the formation of this type of structures is still challenged. So um, I want to point out at this uh, uh, moment that we have been able to produce this type of structures, not only on silicon, but also on metallic, uh, uh, struct, uh, met metallic surfaces or few silicon, so dielectrics. So the uh, periodicity of uh, these structures is similar. So the formation of the structures, uh, I mean, or better, the mechanism is similar. Uh, the only thing that differs is uh, uh, the mechanism, because we have a different uh, physical um, um, uh, I mean, excitation, excitation conditions for metals, uh, semiconductors, and uh, dielectrics. Um, now, uh, another thing that I would like to discuss is that so far I have uh, uh, focused my attention only on uh, uh, cases uh, in which we have uh, hydrodynamical movements. So we have the Gaussian beam and uh, what happens in if we have some uh, uh, no, I mean, if, if we don't have very intense uh, uh, fields or if the material uh, does not exceed the melting point. Um, so um, if uh, the, the material is exposed then you know, to uh, the femtosecond pulses, it is possible that some elastic deformation can be produced. And then we apply elasticity uh, equations to, to describe the formation of these structures. So you see that, um, I mean, here in this example, you can see that um, if we if we describe if we compare the deformation due to elasticity and hydrodynamics, um, it is obvious that uh, the I mean the deformation due elasticity is not so intense. Um, so far, I have talked about the impact of uh, uh, Gaussian beams. So we started with a Gaussian beam. We irradiated the material, and due to the presence of defects, due to corrugation, we were able to uh, produce these uh, far fields, these electromagnetic uh, waves, and the interference of the electromagnetic, wa electromagnetic waves with the uh, incident beam led to the formation of these periodic structures. The question is, uh, what happens if we play with uh, the beam, if, we, for example, we use a, um, two Gaussian beams at an angle, so at an incident angle different from zero. So uh, the interference of these two beams give already an intensity and the profile, periodic profile in the shape of the beam. So depending on the number of the beams and the uh, incident angle, we can end up with these three, for example, here, intensity profiles. So this is very interesting because um, this gives rise to the possibility to control even further the, um, the intensity and, of course, the, to produce uh, complex structures. So this is the intensity, for example, here I have two beams and this is uh, the intensity after I used four beams. Uh, this scheme is called uh, direct, as I said here, direct laser interference patterning. It's called D-LIP. So this is the intensity uh, for this, uh, I mean, after using uh, um, uh, two beams and this is after uh, using four beams. And what is interesting is uh, uh, we can produce uh, periodic structures by uh, 
exploiting this periodicity in the intensity profile. So you see here the, the fingerprint of the of fluid dynamics. And if also we allow, if we use double pulses, and when I say double pulses, we use two pulses, two Gaussian beams separated temporarily uh, by 500 picoseconds, you can see another uh, uh, deformation inside this crater. So if you look at the profile that is produced, after using single pulse or two pulses, you see here another crater that is produced. This is due to the fact that the second pulse sees not a material in uh, a solid phase, but after 500 picosecond, it sees a material in uh, a, a molten phase. So the optical properties of the material, which absorbs the energy, uh, are different. So the, and the energy which is absorbed the difference. Of course, we have done this. We have uh, uh, increased the number of uh, pulses to see what kind of uh, structures uh, we produce, uh, both for single pulses and double pulses. So you see here the craters that are produced and also the periodic structures. And if we use 4D leap, so four beams, we, either with single pulse or with that pulses, we get some uh, very nice complex structures. And also we um, produce even bigger complex, complex uh, I mean, we increase the complexity of uh, the topography by using a combination of Gaussian uh, beam and D-lip separated temporarily between each other. And of course, we change the order of irradiation. And we saw that uh, we ended up with different structures. So it is a combination of uh, electron excitation, I mean, excitation of the material, and also um, uh, fluid dynamics, uh, uh, I mean, uh, behavior that explains the formation of these structures. So we have managed through the scheme to produce this periodic, I mean, so these biomimetic uh, structures. So some extension now of the multi-scale physical modeling, so some other research activities and uh, also uh, focus uh, of our group. Um, we extend in our discussion, I mean, our, our research on uh, a small, I mean, on a different spec spectral region, mid IR, uh, bigger than uh, two micrometers, because uh, on this spectral region, the material behaves, I mean, is more or less um, uh, transparent. So we, we want to see uh, how the material responds. And uh, also, we have been able to describe, uh, I don't know, the video does not seem to, to play, the strain propagation inside uh, metals, uh, semiconductors of silica. Uh, also, we, we wanted to see what happens if we use very short pulses, less than 50 femtoseconds. Uh, we see previously that the electron system uh, gets excited and uh, we have the electron excitation and uh, uh, relaxation of the electron system through electron electron scattering. So if we look at this regime, 50 femtoseconds, um, the theoretical uh, framework shows that uh, in this regime, um, Electron, we have the production of a non thermal elect electron system that uh, interacts with a system which is in the electronic, uh, in the uh, thermal equilibrium, but also we have uh, interaction of the non thermal electron system with the lattice system. So we want to see the response of the material uh, in this regime. Of course, uh, um, uh, it is uh, inter interesting to see for various applications 
how a multi-layer material behaves. So if we use um, a complex, I mean, heterostructures, uh, a complex uh, uh, of uh, uh, thin films uh, with materials that uh, behave, I mean, have different thermal uh, and thermophysical properties in principle. And also we use some machine learning based approaches uh, to do what to facilitate the determination of uh, the laser parameters for the production of uh, uh, features on the surface of uh, the radiated material for specific applications. So uh, just uh, to conclude, uh, we have seen that um, it is very important uh, uh, to, in order to, to understand uh, uh, how to modulate, how to control the uh, energy of the laser and produce structures for certain application. It is very important to understand the, fundament the fundamentals to acquire this fundamental knowledge, how laser interacts with matter. Uh, of course, there are many uh, parameters that need to be discussed, need to be explored. Uh, here in this presentation, I focused only on two of them, laser, laser uh, fluence and uh, number of pulses, the energy dose. Uh, so you understand that um, the manifold of parameters is very big. And this is one of the reasons we want to uh, couple uh, our multi-scale model with uh, um, machine learning based approaches, not only to facilitate, as I said earlier, the determination of, of uh, the laser parameters, um, I mean, in order to produce structures uh, with, I mean, for certain applications, but also uh, we believe that through this scheme, we will be able to reveal uh, new physics, new, I mean, some unexplored physics. So to identify some parameters that play more important role. Uh, it is interesting also to see what happens, um, what is, um, whether we can produce uh, uh, periodic surface structures, some complex uh, uh, biomimetic uh, topographies uh, for some very big uh, photon energies. So if we work on the XUV uh, regime or very small pulse durations. And, um, and another thing is, uh, as I said, to, to, to see, I mean, to, 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 to discuss, I mean, to, to investigate um, both lips formation in fluid dynamics on thin films or multi-layer materials. So this is uh, some uh, ongoing work. And I think that soon we will have some results. And I believe, we believe that this multi-scale modeling uh, is going to be the link, is going to function as a link between basic science and uh, applications. So uh, just uh, to acknowledge uh, 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 a collaboration of uh, all these people in, uh, I mean, throughout the years, I mean, since we started, uh, uh, the, the development of uh, this multi-scale model and um, validation of this model with some experiments that were performed either in our lab or elsewhere uh, to acknowledge you know, these funding uh, projects and of course to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, this is the moment that we take questions from the audience, so please. Uh, just, ah, yes, just a minute because I cannot hear you. So, can you hear me now? Uh, just a minute. Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Ah, perfect. So this is, this is the moment that we take um, questions from the audience. So mm -hmm. um, please raise your hands. I see already two hands raised. Uh, Vangeli, please go ahead. I think Panagiotta was first raised. Ah, Panagiotta, sorry, I yeah. just the hand. Sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Hi, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, I'm a fluid dynamics by trade as well. Uh, and uh, I was, um, uh, I, I found very a lot of nice similarities between convection patterns and and uh, and the patterns here. And uh, well, I guess it's a, an effect of the um, confi it's a confinement uh, effect. And I was, uh, um, I thought perhaps if you have uh, different shapes, what if you have two? Um, two beams next to each other, not uh, interfering, but kind of changing the the domain where uh, where um, uh, this can happen, uh, these patterns can occur. Have you considered that or uh, simulated that as well? So um, the question is, uh, if we, you mean, if we add the material in different positions or in different this is what you mean, and then you see if uh, you produce a fluid, if this fluid interacts. I mean, it, uh, you say uh, you have two two beams mm -hmm. uh, uh, irradiating the material uh, close to each other. Uh, yes, and uh, and so then the the molten uh, material kind of can form a, a shape, not in a circular confinement, but perhaps in a in a, in a different shape. Yes. Uh, no, we have not considered that. We don't know actually if we will uh, lead to the formation of uh, structures, I mean, to some biomimetic structures, because probably um, if, if you are outside, let's say, the, the, the spot radius of uh, uh, each beam, then it's only probably the, the, the edges of the beam that will uh, play some role. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. so uh, so I don't know what kind of uh, uh, surface effects. I mean, what the topography will look like in this case. So we want to to make the most of uh, the energy close to to the center of uh, each beam. It might be interesting to to look at the uh, mm -hmm. two beams uh, focused at the same spot and then slowly, slowly withdrawing them uh, at every experiment. Have different experiments. Yeah. Where this we, yes. What we do, I mean, what we have done also is you know, to 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 perform a scanning experiment. So uh, we move a beam. I mean, so I mean, in certain direction. I mean, across uh, y axis, let's say. And one we see, I mean, in that case, we have some overlapping between beams, mm -hmm. special overlapping of two beams. So we have seen that. So it is uh, similar to the increase of the energy dose. I mean, increase of uh, irradiate, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, number of pulses. Okay. And, and uh, if I can ask one more question, um, uh, a few more details on, uh, on uh, the simulations of the fluid mechanics. How do you perform this? Uh, you mean compute? I mean, uh, yeah. from, the, from the point of view of compute, I mean, I mean, do you use a, a software or is it? Uh, in no, no, this is our software. So we solve the Navier-Stokes equations. We use uh, either finite element or finite difference methods. I mean, in principle, finite element methods. I mean, uh, because as you increase the com the, the corrugation and uh, the, the geometry becomes more steep, uh, so we use finite element methods. Okay, thanks a lot. But it, also we use, uh, because we, be, uh, as you see in this transparency, this is for linearly polarized beam. So, so now as we increase the complexity of the, um, I mean, uh, polarization uh, state we use, then uh, the, uh, the topography becomes uh, more complex. So we want to involve um, the, the employment of uh, other algo algorithms, uh, COMSOL, for example. So my students use this COMSOL to, to solve, uh, uh, I mean, to, 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 
to produce uh, the solution coming out from this, this multi-scale uh, modeling. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bangeli, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. So th thank you very much again, George. It was a great uh, presentation. The very complex, as you said, phenomenon, and many different, uh, many challenges, actually. So just for me, better more to understand some basic, let's say, things. So if I understand where all these structures are rather stable with time, right? So that there is no any reversibility, let's say, on that. So there's, there, is no, there's no, there is no any reversibility. So no. as you, let's say, if you wait for infinite amount of time, What's going to happen to the structures? Are they going to come back to, let's say, the the the, the ones before the, the imposed, let's say, deformation or the imposed modification or not? The the solidification of the material occurs after some nanoseconds. Okay. And then uh, there is solidification. After that. It reaches, I mean, it goes, I mean, the te lattice temperature goes below the, the melting point. So it freezes, it goes, for example, uh, to uh, after uh, some millisecond to the initial state, I mean, to initial uh, temperature, the thermal state. But the, the profile, the topography stays like this, for example. So, so is there any aging effect? If you wait for days, let's say, in this structure? Uh, no, 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 no. You it's don't. very stable. Yes. Okay. And again, as you say about the kinetics, so can you, let's say, uh, also study in detail the kinetics of the phenomenon? Uh, what do you mean the kinetics? To, to I mean, during the formation, let's say, I assume that this, these structures have a different, let's say, stages, sub-stages of formation till to get the, the final one. Yes, uh, the two temperature model, the two temperature model gives information about the lattice. But uh, then when uh, we have material in uh, a molten phase, when it is fluid, then you can uh, describe, I mean, that, I mean the, the, the velocity, I mean, also the displacement at every point. There you have a molten material, as you say, molten material dynamics, but is the temperature constant? No. This, no. It's not. I'm just trying to understand this. the temperature, because as you say, you have a two temperature model, but I assume that in practice, you would have a gradient of temperatures. Um, you, you, see, you see here, this is the, the profile, this is fluid. This is fluid, okay. and you see mm -hmm. a gradient of temperature. This is the gradient of temperature. You have the navier stokes and these parameters, the, the, the density and the viscosity uh, are temperature dependent. When I say temperature dependent, lattice temperature dependent. So you can say, you can envisage that as uh, that the lattice, that the electron, the, the two temperature uh, model uh, becomes a single temperature model after, I mean, when the relaxation occurs, so the electron, I mean, the I mean, electron and the lattice system have the same temperature. Okay, so it is the lattice that moves. But this is not the temperature of the environment, right? So no, 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 no. Yes. So this no. means that this this temperature deviate, this temperature curves that you saw there, the the, the 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 data should dependent should be dependent on time. Yes. Okay. So if you wait for a long time, then the temperature profile will be flat, more or less. No, not flat. Not flat, depends on, uh, you have, uh, uh, I mean, why do you say flat? No, I'm just wondering about the dissipation. So uh, after a long time, you should have dissipation of, of uh, if you are in an environment under constant temperature, right? So after a long time, yeah. all the temperature should be the same with the environment. Uh, if you don't have the gradient. No, even if you have the gradient, after a long time, the material mm -hmm. should have the, 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 the temperature of its environment. The, the, the deformation might be there. But yes. I'm just trying to understand here, yeah, you see the, the thermal, let's say, the equilibration of the, of the nanostructures. Okay, the deformation will be there, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. But, and then they, they would reach 300K or, or yeah. Uh, yeah, whatever you have. Yes, exactly. After some microsecond, sorry, milliseconds. Millisecond. Millisecond. So that's the time scale. Yeah, okay. Yes. I was wondering about the time scale of the phenomenon. So it's about milliseconds. Yes. So and after then, that, yes. And when you have the, the fluid there, then you would have the fluid phase again for such a length time scale, or it would be even for longer time scales. Fluids, uh, uh, I mean the, the fluid. I mean uh, the resolidification ends after some nanoseconds. Ah, the, the resolidification ends so fast. Yes, some nanosecond, and then you have the relaxation. I mean the relaxation. The Let's say the transition to uh, to the initial uh, temperature uh, around three hundred. I mean uh, some uh, uh, milliseconds. And in all these cases, we are talking about free surfaces, George, right? Yes. Yes. So is it possible? Let's say also experimental. I don't know if this is. Uh, if this is important, but to, to, to examine, let's say, to get this temperature and uh, the deformation inside the material, not only the surface, but to go in the depth, let's say. Um, I mean, well, the problem is that um, experiments, with the experiment is that you can see only the, the results. Uh, so you have to perform some AFM experiments to, and to take some cross sections. So to break it and to see some cross sections to see the the height, the actual height, because this is a same image, which is not uh, representative of uh, the height and the depth of the the. the I was profile. thinking about tomography, as you say, to to also to get yes. information about the depth. Mm -hmm. Is this important for 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 the for the phenomenon, uh, or it's not so it, much? It is important from the. Uh, no, not so much the height, but the complexity of uh, the structures. For example, here you see some uh, simple periodic structures, but the, the topography, the complexity of the um, of the structures, for example, to produce this complexity or even this complexity, so the topography that you produce rather than the height or the depth, is more important. And the last one, again, is a general. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand. So here you have a, also experimental, let's say, a big advantage that you can modify the structure by changing the intensity of the laser. Mm -hmm. So let's say if we go from the what you describe as, as uh, a picosecond to femtosecond, and now, nowadays you can go even to attosecond, right? So is there any, let's say, standard way to, to, to know at least even for a few, let's say, reference cases, uh, stand, the, the same material. Let's say to know in advance what you expect, that, that's the first. Yes. Mm -hmm. We know that, um, uh, I mean, certainly there are, there's a number of uh, periodic structures that you can produce even with nanosecond or picosecond uh, uh, pulse lasers. Uh, we see that the femtosecond uh, uh, pulse lasers help more. Now we are, uh, but currently they are still very expensive. Now we have uh, started some experiments uh, in the lab of uh, Paris Jalas to see if we use attosecond pulses, uh, if we see, if we observe, similar periodic structures or more complex periodic structures or structures that we have not seen yet. But uh, this is uh, an ongoing experiment. And uh, um, from the uh, from a theoretical point of view, it appears that uh, uh, there are some uh, type of uh, damage on the material. But uh, um, also it appears that the, the size, the height of the, the, the material, the, the, the height of uh, 
these ripples are very, very small, uh, which uh, I, I don't know whether you know, the, the, the experimentalists can observe it. So we, some experiments we have already performed show that there's no damage at all. So we, uh, this suggests that either we have to uh, uh, to increase the, the the intensity and the laser, I mean the, the, the energy of uh, uh, of the beam, or uh, probably at a second is not uh, uh, probably a good strategy and, and to, 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 to towards uh, fabricated structures, periodic surface structures. And the last, let's say, the follow up now from the theoretical point of view, you presented this nice, let's say, model that tries to capture all this uh, phenomena. So when you change the intensity, let's say, do you expect that you need to modify also the model or more or less the physical phenomena are already been, being captured, let's say, satisfactorily? Uh, if we change the intensity, uh, if, um... I'm Certainly. just trying to understand, you know, what are, let's say, yeah. the accuracy of the model, if, if the accuracy of the model depends on the intensity of the, of the, of the parts. Let's say. It, it, yes, uh, th this is a very good question. Um, it certainly, depending on the uh, excitation level, you might end up with the introduction of a diff of a different mechanism that should be included. I mean, so uh, if I go to to this scheme, for example, so this is the excitation of uh, this is a source term, and also uh, it includes also the excitation of uh, the material. So uh, some parameters such, such as the single photon absorption or two photon absorption, or some parameter related to the impact ionization should be revised uh, if, uh, depending on, let's say, the, the photon energy we use. I mean, if we uh, increase, let's say, the photon energy, probably uh, these parameters should be uh, revised, or we have to uh, include uh, uh, some more parameters. That's why we want to span over various uh, photon energy to see how these uh, parameters vary. So in principle, uh, this is a model that works. I mean, uh, I'm not talking about the, uh, the two temperature model uh, and the fluid dynamics, which uh, more or less are some uh, standard uh, uh, te techniques you know, to, to, to describe the dynamics, but I'm referring to, the, to how we describe the excitation level of uh, the material. So uh, that's why also I said that uh, it is important also to, uh, to see the, the impact of some other parameters, crystal orientation, angle of incidence, pulse duration that we have already started working on, the, ma the material, the material or the thickness of the material, better the thickness of the material, we know a, th a bulk material has different optical properties than a very thin material, different re reflectivity. Uh, you might have uh, uh, multiple reflection inside the material. So these are cases we have to to incorporate in, in, in the model. So we have, uh, we have started and we have revised in many cases our model. Also the polarization state, this is very important as well about the effects, the electromagnetic effects and the electromagnetic fingerprints. So that influences also the energy absorption. Thank you very much, George. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicola, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, can you uh, explain one more time uh, how you are able to, to, to uh, create those uh, periodic structures? How, how you, uh, as I understand, your, your laser uh, hits the material 
in the same periodic uh, manner. So, so, so how do you do you this with with the with the laser beam? If you can, uh, yeah. because I didn't get it. Uh, sorry, uh, can. Do you hear me? Yes, it broke. I mean, the, the, the answer, I couldn't, then uh, there was some noise. If you can repeat your question. Yes, yes, yes. So, so uh, my question is, is about uh, how you can create uh, the periodic structures, if you can uh, uh, explain it one more time, because uh, I didn't get, get it very well. Uh, okay, so here. Okay, so, so we start. Uh, the first thing is uh, we produce uh, with one pulse uh, uh, this corrugation, let's say. Yeah. So the, a, a corrugated profile, so if we uh, irradiate a corrugated profile, then uh, from if we solve the uh, Maxwell equations, uh, to describe the propagation of the electromagnetic field, then we uh, see that the far fields of the, so the, 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 the waves, the surface waves that are produced uh, after scattering of these defects interfere with each other, and they interfere also with. So they, they, they produce this electromagnetic fingerprint and they interfere also with the incident beam. So the result is that uh, this electromagnetic, especially modulated fields and intensity will, uh, uh, will be translated into the electron temperature. Okay, oops, uh, into the electronic temperature. So the electronic temperature will have a, a periodic profile, especially. So upon relaxation, this electron, uh, upon relaxation and after electron phonon coupling, this specially modulated uh, uh, profile will be translated into the lattice temperature. Okay, so the lattice temperature we have a periodic profile, and then after uh, melting of the material, this will be translated into the um, hydrodynamic parameters. Okay, so uh, the, the the displacement or the the pressure will have a specially modulated uh, for, form. Okay, so if I understood correctly, this depends on the material, right? I mean, the the periodicity that you, the periodic structure that we that the, you will get. I mean, if if you shoot the same laser beam to another material, you maybe get a, a different uh, structure. You need to have defects. You need to have corrugation on your structure on your uh, yeah. on on the surface. So it's not material dependent. Okay. Uh, surface dependent. It, it is surface dependent in principle. Okay. Okay. It, it is also it is also material dependent because the orientation of these waves depends on the dielectric parameters of the material. The orientation. So few silica. I mean uh, dielectric materials and so or metallic materials. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, 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 dictate the propagation of these surface waves in different uh, directions. Okay, uh, so so it is it is also a dynamic phenomenon because uh, as you sh for as you shoot the, the laser beam, there are new defects on the material or on the surface. So. I this makes it even uh, more uh, difficult to control it, right? Uh, it is. I'm sorry. It. I am. Saying, I'm trying to say that uh, as you shoot the the, the, the laser beam, uh, 
-hmm. then you get more defects or new yes. defects. So, mm -hmm. so it is even more difficult to control uh, the structure that you want to to uh, to create. Let's say. Uh, no, I. Okay. We simulations and also the experiment shows that it does matter uh, does not matter how many defects you know. I mean the, the corrugation uh, pattern uh, does not. Uh, 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 affect influence a lot. Uh, you see here, you know, the, um, with uh, some defects and with bigger number of defects. Okay, so he, you see these black dots, and so you see here smaller number of dots. More or less, you get the similar profile. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It was a very nice uh, presentation. A new, a new field. <laughs> that, that's uh, why you asked. Uh, I asked uh, so many questions, so thank you again. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I hope that I didn't confuse you. <clears throat> no, no, it's more clear now. <laughs> thank you, Raja. Um, thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tbilis, for the answer. Um, does anyone else have a question? If not, may I ask a question then? Uh, yes. If it's okay. Okay. Um, so, my question lies more in the hypothetical uh, realm, I guess. Um, <clears throat> if I have an amorphous polymer covered in a thin film, could I, in principle, could I mount a laser in an XPS and monitor the the modification of the of the of the of the surface? So if I have a thin film but I don't know the coating, I have I have input from AFM, let's say, to that how the surface is formed. Mm -hmm. If I want to add a second material, let's say if I want to add cobalt and have a, a thin film split between copper and cobalt to and study its properties, could I, with the help of an apparatus or with, with a femtolaser, smoothen the surface or at least have a, have a by, by monitoring the core energy, core electron binding energies, that mm -hmm. means I know how many bonds I have on the surface at any given time. Could I... <laughs> have a, like a quantitative model of my new surface using this um, device? Unfortunately, I cannot answer the question. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. I mean, I just uh, thought being generated from the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, anyway. Uh, so yeah, uh, if we have no more questions, uh, I guess we can end the presentation here, right? <clears throat> okay, perfect. Thank you very much again for this uh, amazing talk. And uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, seeing more in the future, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. It was excellent. Yeah. So next time, we, we hope that we will have you here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.